We're trying to do learn and grow or grow and trust. So here's where the team, you know, here's what we set out to do today. Here's what we actually did. Let's talk about why we, how we did it, the human errors. But now let's talk about really the deep level whys. You know, what were the human factors? What are we gonna change in the organization to make sure this doesn't happen again? Because I said earlier, no one in that team there most likely intentionally made those mistakes or those missteps. So let's figure out how we're gonna set up the organization, those gaps and close those gaps in the system so we don't have this happen again. What lessons we learned so we can take that back next time. Because that's really what the debrief is all about. It's not about a performance review. It's not about evaluating how you did as a person, or a team, but it's really how the team did and how we're going to improve next time. Hello and welcome to the Leadership Launchpad, where we help technical managers improve themselves, their teams, and their organizations. On this show, I talk with industry leaders, coaches, authors, and experts to give you actionable insights to help improve your own performance and the performance of those around you. Our guest today is Brandon Williams. Brandon helps leaders transform their teams into high-performing, high-reliability organizations by harnessing the same tools used by U.S. Air Force fighter pilots. Leveraging his work in human factors and human performance research, his methodology equips leaders to organize, lead, and operate effectively in volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous environments where human error is prevalent. In this episode, you can expect to learn what human factors engineering is in relation to teams and organizations, how to break out of the traditional blame and train approach, as well as Brandon's four-step process for creating a high-performing, high-reliability team. Before we get into the discussion, I do want to take one second to ask that you please take just a moment to like this episode or rate this podcast. If you find this information helpful and you think other people would find it helpful, I really ask that you take just a moment because that is the best way to help us increase our reach and get exposure. I know how valuable your time is, and so it really means a lot to me. With that, let's get into the discussion with Brandon Williams. Brandon, you and I have had remarkably similar careers in many ways. We both went to the Air Force Academy. We both became pilots, and now we're both in you know in this leadership development world. Uh, I gotta I gotta start by asking kind of an off the wall question. But did you ever put your mechanical engineering degree to use, or are you like me, where my physics degree I, I don't know what what I ever did with that. <laughs> Yeah. Well, Matt, first of all, thanks. Uh, thank you so much for having me on. Uh, appreciate it. Love all your content you put out on LinkedIn and on thank social you. media. So uh, that's obviously how we got connected. But, um, I, you know, I've had this exact conversation before with people and I, <laughs> matter of fact, I talk about it with my wife and other people I always joke. And I said, you know, I, I you know, I have a mechanical engineering degree, <laughs> but I've, <laughs> like you said, I've never really used that per se in that yeah. profession. I will say, I think mechanical engineering, um, probably several other engineering type techie courses, as we called it at the the academy, I they have definitely helped me. And I've definitely, yeah. I know I have a phenomenal basis for problem solving. Um, really, yeah. I think yeah. anything you want to go into, that's a good basis for. So the, the short answer is no, but I think it is a great, uh, it is a great way to look and analyze problems. And, and also when I was there, really, I mean, I, I was always a math person uh, when yeah. I was younger, at least two plus two was always four. So that just kind of <laughs> drew, drew me to there, but. Yeah. I mean, I think you're totally right. Uh, it's, it, you know, f- physics and and then all of engineering for sure. It's, it's a way of looking at the world. It's a set. Mm-hmm. I, I love that you lo- use the term problem solving because mm-hmm. that's really what it is, is it's a mindset of how to solve problems, which, yeah, I think I'm, I'm similar to you. Like I've never directly used my physics degree, but on the other hand, I use it every single day, you know, and right. it certainly helps me in, in so many ways. Um, so it's interesting, you know, we're, we're both, we were both pilots. I remember back when I was flying, um, doing a lot of, you know, uh, so I, I was in a, you know, a, a crewed aircraft. So we would do these CRM simulation, crew resource management simulations, where mm-hmm. the whole point was to figure out how to work together. Um, had a lot of discussion about this idea of, humans in the cockpit where i think surprisingly to many people flying is much less about like the devices the things the planes and it's so much about the people the the 
emotions behind it, how people work in these complex systems. Mm -hmm. I know you focus a lot on that aspect of, of human factors. For people who have never heard of human factors, what, what are they? Yeah, so human factors is really when you when you start off with engineering, we're talking about my degree, but really human yeah. factors, when you talk about that, typically is associated with what we called human factors engineering. And it really it. is the idea of, you know, everything we use, technology we use is, is humans. This laptop you're on or computer, or those audio video audio visual equipment you're using, you know, the cars you drive, the chairs you sit in, everything we use has some type of human factors engineered in it. In other words, someone said, here's how the human's going to interact with this to make it mm. comfortable for them, or to make yeah. it easy to use, or yeah. to, you know, prevent error, you know, or when you, the keys on a keyboard, they're laid out for a specific reason, you know, how we're going yeah. to move our hands. And that's been learned over time and things like that. So typically human factors associated with that. What I did was kind of pulled that out because, you know, when I was in the Air Force, in addition to being a pilot, one of the things I also did was an aviation safety officer, which, as yeah. you know, um, I was trained at the flight safety school, aviation safety school in the Air Force, qualified to go in and investigate aircraft mishaps. So when an aircraft had an incident or an accident, we go in and find kind of the root cause, lessons learned, and, and what we recommend to happen you know, for the organization so that these type of actions don't happen again. And what I really learned from that, what they really harp on, uh, both in the Air Force and on the civilian side, is that all accidents really result from, you know, human factors, uh, yeah. more specifically human error. Okay, there's always a human in the chain somewhere, you know, airplanes don't just fly into weather, um, parts don't just fail, someone maintained that yeah. part, someone designed that part, someone operated that part. Uh, there's always a human somewhere in the decision where, and it's not always the pilot. It could be, like I said, support personnel, maintenance, air traffic control, yeah. design of the system by people that did. So whole host of things there. But the point of all that is when you're asking about human factors, what I did is kind of pull that out and say, Hey, you know, we talk about how we design our technology and, and systems and everything around this. So, but what we don't talk about a lot about, I don't think is human factors within teams as leaders, because really the ultimate job of a leader, I think, is to help your people mitigate human error, which is really what human factors comes down to is how do we, because you're never going to eliminate human error, right? As long as humans are in something, we're always going to have human error. We're prone to it. I mean, what's, it's what makes us human. Um, so, I mean, human, human factors is really how we as leaders help our people mitigate that human error. And that goes back to understanding how we as humans operate within our environments. Um, I mean, the wiring up here in this machine hasn't changed a whole lot since we were being chased by tigers not, and not building fires yeah. in caves. And yeah. I mean, now the world has changed dramatically, obviously, but the way we process information in our subconscious and in our conscious mind and, you know, and make decisions, the wiring is still kind of the same. So we have to understand that, you know, things like complacency, fatigue, um, you know, lack of understanding, lack of awareness, all these things come into play when we have to talk about our team. So leaders have to understand these human factors because like I said, nobody, no professional ever shows up to work saying, Hey, I'm going to do a bad job today. Hey, I'm going to make a mistake. Yeah. I mean, no professional does that in, in a professional yeah. organization. So really a leader leadership is about understanding what those human factors are with our teams. And then how do we help those be our people um, mitigate those human errors and, and obviously take that organization to a high performing, high reliability organization. I was I was just going to bring up that that term that you often talk about that high performing high reliability organization because I think that's the thing that often differentiates the military or pieces of the military is that it's it's one thing to be able to achieve great results it's another thing to be able to consistently achieve those results which is what we expect certainly out of pilots and out of doctors and out of a lot of professions and so it makes sense that you have to kind of go back to this idea of you as a leader helping to make sure people don't make mistakes. That Because I, I think what happens is, and you, you can tell me if this is what you see, very often it's like, oh, well, the you know, a leader would say something like, well, my people aren't responding a certain way, or my people aren't doing what I would expect them to do, or they're not following the guidelines. Is that kind of one of the first things that you often see when you when you're when you're talking to leaders that this idea that like well no it's not me it's them 
Yeah, and like they, they just don't get it. And what yeah. that really goes, or that that's what they say. They just don't get it. You yeah. know, why can't yeah. I, I? How many times I've sat in offices or in a call with a whether it's a you know VP of sales or a president or a you know leader of this organization? They're like, you know, Brandon, I just can't get him to do this. And that's really where I came up with the idea of my full mm. methodology was I would do these keynotes around process improvement, and they would these leaders would come up at the end, and everyone would say, "This is great, but how do you keep? How do you get people accountable? Mm. How do you make them?" Yeah. Do How do you help them make decisions? And yeah. so that was exactly, you know, exactly it. And, um, you know, what that really comes down to that, that mindset you're talking about is really stems from this old school, what I call it, blame and train approach. You know, that was mm. the classical way of management and leadership was in leadership, you know, is, well, Matt, you know, didn't do this right. Let's say Matt, he, he missed the cell. He didn't close his client. Well, Matt clearly doesn't know how to close. So let's go train Matt up on how to do this. Well, let's, let's debrief that a little bit. You, you think, yeah. you know, I'm sure Matt has a skill set if he got to where he's at. Sure. We could all use some better learning and development around our particular trade. Absolutely. But let's really get down to the deep level root causes of this. You know, maybe Matt didn't get the right marketing materials. Maybe Matt was unaware of this client. Maybe Matt just got this thrown on his plate today. Maybe Matt's got something going on in his life that's causing him, you know, or in his professional life as well, causing him physical, mental fatigue. You know, let's really understand the organizational gaps that we need to close or practices yeah. we need to change in order to drive improvement. Um, yeah. And that's really where we're kind of jumping ahead, but that's really where the, the idea of the debrief culture, which is a huge part of my methodology, which comes from our world as well as aviators comes from, and taking yeah. that business is it's complete opposite of what I call that blame and train approach. That idea, what you're talking about, mm. is, well, these people just don't get it. They're just not closing the deal. They're just not doing this. They're not doing that. You know, and, and really it's, well, let's understand why. Because you really think they're not doing this because they don't want to. Uh, highly unlikely. Unless yeah. they just completely don't like you for whatever reason. But typically that's that's not the case. So you're absolutely yeah. right. Yeah. So, so let's kind of walk through this evolution then of you started off working with folks where you're teaching them kind of this change management piece and they're just like, but how do, how do we get people to follow through? They're not really, they're not executing the way I want. They're not following the rules that I've laid out. I have this amazing vision. What, what's going on? How do you take them on those first steps of getting them to apply these human factors to either maybe it's sometimes changing what they're delivering or, or how they're delivering it to their teams? Yeah, absolutely. Well, the first step is is really understanding kind of the baseline, the, the environment yeah. that we're all operating in, right? So all these organizations yeah. I work with, you know, typically in the uh, tech sector, financial, uh, healthcare, pharmaceutical, a lot of sales teams, you know, a lot of what I call teams that have to be high reliable organizations, right? High reliability. Yeah. So, you know, mistakes can mean not lives lost necessarily. Well, in healthcare, it can, or pharmaceutical, certain yeah. industries, but- yeah. Typically, it can be loss of sales, loss of revenue, you name it. So the the, the first step is is understand the environment they're in. You know these what yeah. I call comp complexity, complex environments. Now, yeah. complexity is a big word, and you know I think people have different ideas of it, but really complexity is a systems based way of thinking. Saying hey, you know complexity really defines a, a system that has many different interdependent yeah. variables affecting it at any one time. So obviously yeah. that related directly back to the world we came from, flying, yeah. aviation, different variables yeah. we're always trying to deal with. And you can't possibly, the human can't possibly predict yeah. how these variables are going to affect our state at some point in the future. I yeah. mean, we can kind of prepare for it. We can definitely build our situational awareness around it, but it's not always going to, to you know, we always can't predict that future. So that's the baseline. I think one of the greatest explanations of this idea of complexity came from the book Team of Teams by General Stanley mm -hmm. McChrystal, where I he talked that. about, Absolutely. yeah, you know, the difference between complex and complicated, where a watch right. is complicated, right? It's got all these little moving parts, but it's predictable, whereas right. the weather is complex, where you, there's there's just, there's so many, as you said, so many inputs, so many outputs, it's basically impossible to come up with a, a reliable model of what's going to be happening. Right. And I love to, I use a very similar model. I use like I'm on stage a lot of times in my keynotes, I say, Hey, you know, the F-15E, the Strike Eagle, the airplane I flew in the Air Force, yeah. right? Yeah. Now a Strike Eagle, F-15E, and I show a picture of the cockpit, all the dials and displays. And yeah. I'm like, would you consider that complicated? They're like, yeah. 
I'm like, but it's not in and of itself is not complex. I mean, yeah, we can build a strike eagle. We've enough schooling, enough technology, enough money. We've built hundreds of them. We can teach yeah. a pilot to fly that airplane, take off, fly around, come back and land. So it's complicated. It may take some time, understanding, learning to do it, but it's not complex. I mean, it's designed to work a certain way, very predictable. Yeah. But you take that strike eagle and you throw it into a, an environment of ever-changing conditions, whether it's weather, combat, terrain, dealing with other assets, your airplane, rear fuel on the back of another airplane, all these different variables, that defines complexity. So you're, yeah, I love that, yeah. love that example and you're, you're 100% right. But yeah. once you establish that baseline, now you're like, okay, well, what does that do to your teams? What does complexity always do? It drives human error. Because do we as humans, yeah. do we like complexity? No, we like simple, right? We like habit. Yeah. We like predictability. That's why we tend to be complacent because that's actually where we want to be. We want to be comfortable a lot of times. We oh. want to be you know, complacent if we can. That's what we're striving to, right? Even though we know that okay. that's really not a way to, to get better. Yeah. Or, or yeah, yeah, yeah. We found earlier yeah. that wasn't a way to survive, right? So yeah. how do we help our people with that? And there's really four kind of big areas. I'll just hit them real quick. The first is clear intent, which really goes yep. back to – like you were just saying earlier, you got all these things you want to do, all these, inevitably I'll ask these uh, leaders, I'll say, Hey, you know, Matt, what do you want to do this year, this quarter? Inevitably they'll list off like 10, 15 things. I'm like, okay, that's great. But what are your top three priorities? Yeah. I'm like, well, we got to do yeah. all of it. Well, okay. No, what's the top three? Because yeah. you and I both know sitting in those cockpits, there's all these hundreds of dollars. Of debt. We, we can't possibly take in all the information. What make you talking earlier about airmen, you know, it's not more about the technical skill set. It's about the airmanship, the decision making that really is what we're teaching a lot of times as instructors when we taught in, in, in pilot training and, and things like that. So how do you focus down to the most important things? And that really starts with a clear intent and narrow focus. You know, I, I relate I it back to commander's intent, you know, highly yeah. uh, defined, desired in state picture, not the how you want to do something, but a very clear focused picture on what that looks like. That's the first thing, because that's how you combat complexity right narrow it down for yeah. the people second situation awareness which i know you know that term very well um any pilot yes. knows that term how do we take in all these variables at any one moment and a lot of times that starts back before we even walk out the door you know considering the environment we're going to be in you know resources we have actions we've taken in the past the people we need to have on this team but I also talk a lot about during execution, how you maintain situational awareness. So when people are executing their plans, how do leaders help their people with situational awareness? You know, um, and then I go into the third thing is mutual support, which, you know, all leaders, I think most people would agree that they want autonomous teams. They want people who can make decisions on their own, yep. highly decentralized teams. I think most people accept that the world we live in, you have to have teams that can do that in yep. order to adapt and change very quickly. Well, we also know that autonomy without any type of accountability can be yeah. dangerous though. So, but accountability, I think all, it a lot of times it gets a negative connotation. It, I always say it kind of, I always kind of think of my vice principal from elementary school when I think of, you know, people, people say accountability, it's like do this or else, you know, type. Yeah. So I always, mutual support is really peer level, uh, peer accountability. It's oh, that type like of accountability. It. Yep. When you're talking about CRM earlier, the wingman concept, you know, this idea that, you know, if you and I were in a squadron together, Matt, you know, even if we're the same rank, it didn't really matter. Um, I didn't want you to fail, not because I was worried about getting fired if, if you didn't do well or you didn't do well on this mission today, but I wanted you to do well. I wanted to support you because that made the team better, but I also knew you. I knew, you know, things about you, where you came from. We work together. We fly together. We, a lot of camaraderie. And so it's this, this mutual support is kind of this deep level you know, peer accountability that we truly care yeah. more about the betterment of the team than our own personal success. So I give a lot of tips on how to do that and, mm. and how to encourage that, which a lot of times starts with leadership. Shocking, I know. <laughs> uh, displaying this themselves, being accountable themselves, showing transparency. And then I finally finish it up with with debriefing, um, the debrief cultures I, I mentioned earlier, which really goes back to, you know, a lot of people talk about after action reports. They talk about postmortems. They talk about uh, you know, 360s or look backs or whatever you're going to call it. But really the debrief, what I think sets it apart, and I know you're very familiar with this too, you've been a military aviator though, is, you know, how we set a specific level, like what I call a tone of accountability, where we shut yeah. that door and we debrief, 
you know, as you know, rank comes off. Doesn't matter your rank. Yep. You can be the highest ranking person. You can be the lowest ranking person in that room. But we have to have an environment we can talk about some missteps we had and successes. And it's yep. not an investigation. It's not trying to yep. point blame to Matt. Hey, Matt, this is your fault. You know, fix this. That's blame and train. You know, we're trying to do yep. learn and grow or grow and trust. So here's where the team, you know, here's what we set out to do today. Here's what we actually did. Let's talk about why we, how we did it, the human errors. But now let's talk about really the deep level whys. You know, what yep. were the human factors? What are we going to change in the organization to make sure this doesn't happen again? Because I said earlier, no one in that team there most likely intentionally made those mistakes or those missteps. So let's figure out how we're going to set up the organization, those gaps and close those gaps in the system so we don't have this happen again. And what lessons we learn so we can take that back next time. Because that's really what the debrief is all about. Yeah. Is it's not about a performance review. It's not about evaluating how you did as a person or a team, but it's really how the team did and how we're going to improve next time. And that's where you get to that high performing level we talk about. Um, but that really is how you go. All those four kind of areas is kind of the, the summary, you know, clear intent, how you focus on, get a very narrow focus. That's how you weed through a lot of that complexity, that situation yep. awareness, because you have all those different variables affecting you. So how do we maintain that level? Because as you know, situation awareness is a varying scale, right? We can have low, we can yeah. have high. Yeah. And then uh, mutual support, because we know there's going to be errors. We know that we're going to make missteps. We know that we're going to have our decisions affected by this complexity. So how do we have our team help us hold accountable? Yeah. And then finally debriefing. How do we learn from what we did? How do we set up environment, a culture, a tone, you know, communication worlds where we can, we can really talk about those missteps we can ultimately improve. Um, so that's kind of the big four big areas that I, that I talk about when, that you start with. And obviously I give a lot of methodologies, frameworks. And Absolutely. How to do that. Well, I'd love to, I mean, there's so much great stuff in there. I'd love to kind of dive in a little bit deeper on a couple pieces, especially because sure. I think, you know, in some ways those, they kind of reinforce, reinforce each other, obviously in a lot of ways, but I think, you know, that idea of mutual support and the debrief culture kind of together. One thing that I think is challenging is that in the flying world, when you're in the debrief, the nice thing about it is chances are like, there's very little way for what happens in any one debrief to like affect you as a broader like officer, like your career, mm -hmm. you know, right? Like chances right, are right. your commander, whether it's a your flight commander or your squadron commander or whoever, probably isn't in there with you unless you happen to be flying with them that day. Right. So the people right. who you're debriefing with don't really have any kind of, you know, formal say of of like right. how your career is going. So sure. it kind of becomes a little bit easier to, as you said, take that right. rank off and have a true discussion about what's going on. Right. Where very often in the business world, that's often not how it is. And the people who directly control your career are the ones who are involved in that discussion. And I'm, I'm assuming that, you know, when you talk about that mutual support and debrief culture, that those can kind of tie together to, to build. But, but what advice do you give for organizations to try to create that debrief culture? Because to me, that's one of the, one of the hardest things for people to do as you know, Brene Brown would say, is to like take that armor off and right. really honestly look at the performance without immediately having like lights flashing in your eyes of, oh, I'm not going to get promoted or, oh my gosh, I'm going to be fired. Um, right, right. Yeah. How, how, do you, how do you help organizations or how can organizations make that transition? That, I mean, that's a great question because obviously that comes up all the time. You know, yeah. a, a very similar way, a lot of people will say, well, you know, Brandon, this is great stuff. And I, I really think this would work, but, you know, I'm just a, you know, worker bee or I'm just at this level. And, yeah. and I don't really work for anybody who has a real, you know, tone of accountability. You know, that they're not going to admit <laughs> their own mistakes and they're certainly don't. Yeah. So yeah. that happens a lot. And so there's, there's a few different things I always tell people is in that case, would that say, Matt, you know, you're working for someone, you're like, I love this idea, but I'd. Nobody's, I'm working with a client right now who just, I just went to their organization about three or four weeks ago and they said, Hey, it's kind of, you know, the momentum's kind of slowing down. They're not really brace embracing this debrief, this human factors approach. Can you come yeah. in and can we talk? So I'm working with now yeah. to kind of give them some ideas and, and work with some of their teams. But first is always say, start small. 
you know, so if you're that person yeah. that you are embracing it or you do see it, you know, start small. It could just be you and a peer. Hey, after a sales call, I do this with my sales teams all the time. I'm like, just sit down over a cup of coffee, 15, 20 minutes. Let's just talk about the sales call, how it went, you know, good or bad. Let's just, you don't, a debrief doesn't mean you have to go in a room, shut the door and sit there for two hours and yes. hash all this yes. out. Now, I mean, for yes. large tasks and, and quarterly goals, and it probably should, but it doesn't have to be. I mean, that's, that's really what a debrief culture is about, is about embracing this idea of this tone of accountability in the spirit of wanting to improve. So that's the first thing. Yeah. Start small, influence where you can. So mm -hmm. maybe you're a small team leader. You don't have three or four salespeople in your whatever organization you're in. Just start there. Just start debriefing there, you know, with your team, where it can be yeah. a lot of clients I work with, they'll do, you know, weekly meetings on a whether it's a Friday or Thursday. They take 30 minutes or an hour and just kind of do a mini debrief of the the week's events or things they did there. Just to kind of yeah you know, get it going. And it doesn't have to be a formal process. It, it can be, you yeah. know, as long as you follow the same tenets, you know, it, it yeah. you can get that kind of that going. So that's the first thing. But the second thing, if you're a leader and you truly want people to be honest in a debrief, right? You, you don't want to have what I call that artificial harmony tone. Cause I think a lot of times we as humans, mm. we get together and, and what do we do? We like artificial harmony. We just kind of want to avoid yes. some of the conflict. So yes, and I always say that's great for social functions. It's great, but it's not <laughs> great for if you no. want to improve your team. It's just not. Yeah. So how do you get that, what I call respectful truth out? That truth, honesty, you know, of, of, of the team's execution. Again, not being critical of Matt or anyone else, but the team's execution. And so the first thing, again, I know this is shocking, but it goes back to what? Leaders and leadership, yep. right? So, and here's another great point with that. You know, just like from the flying world, as you and I talked about, we go on a debrief. Like you said earlier, if I was a formation flight lead that day and I go in the debrief, well, we don't bring the squander commander and the director of operations, yeah. our number ones and twos in the room, right? It's just no. whoever executed that day. That's all that's in there. Yep. And you as the flight lead may not be the most senior ranking person, but guess what? You were running that team that day. So you are yep. going to lead that debrief. So what I always say, and I used to do this, especially when I was a uh, pilot training instructor in the Air Force. I'd always start the debrief with, you know, say you were the student and I'd say, hey, Matt, you know, today I noticed your landings, you were landing a little long. And I'm going to take that back on me because I know in the instructional brief, I didn't really give you some good techniques on your power pull and I noticed your power pull was late. So I think if I would have done that, I think your landings really would have been better. So that's what we're going to work on next time. Now, what have I done just right there? Yeah. This young, you know, 20, what, 22, 23 year old pilot training student looking at this you know, experienced military aviator is saying, wow, you know, they're taking responsibility for what I did today. Then I can definitely open up to my mistakes. Yeah. So that's the first thing yeah. I say as leaders, we've got to embrace this idea of accountability, you know, transparency, you know, so start that debrief off with, Hey, here's some things I could have done better for the team today. Here's some missteps I had. That's the first thing. Yeah. Yeah. And then just like you said, you know, what do people want to see? They want to see consistency. What they want to see that these debriefs are working. So if you come out of that debrief and you say, hey, Matt, I need to talk to you right now. And you go and say, we're not going to let you do this again. You know, we're, you go back to that blame and train approach. Well, of course, people aren't going to want to do it, right? Yeah. So you as a leader, if you want that to set throughout the organization, you've got to see people, you go into the debrief and, and you know, like we used to call it, what kind of what stays in the debrief or happens in the debrief sure. stays in the debrief. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. But we still pull lessons learned out. But we don't necessarily have yeah. to know have to have to know how the sausage was made, right? So if if people see you doing that, then they will say, Okay, this really is maybe, maybe this really can help us. Maybe I really can be yeah. open in here. And they'll start small and then kind of work their way up. Um, but you're yeah. you're hundred percent right. I mean, it is not I mean, let's face it, human factors, it's not natural to go in and talk yeah. about how we could have done better or our mistakes yeah. we made, especially in front of like you said, someone who does our performance review or as our boss or our manager. So yeah. it is definitely a challenge. It's definitely a huge rudder to turn. But once you embrace it, and I think once you see the improvement it can make, that's really where people can, you know, say, hey, okay, this this maybe there is something to this. Yeah. I I think you are so spot on in that idea of kind of start small and start where you can. And I also think, you know, to that consistency piece, that's where it's really important for, I think, leaders who are wanting to change things or try new things to be extremely transparent 
about what they're trying to change. I'm sure that's why it's, it's so great what you do, because, you know, you have organizations who are saying, OK, we want to adopt this kind of culture, but they're not just trying to, like, suddenly, you know, change it out, out, out from underneath everybody or a leader is going to start introducing a debrief without talking about it. It's like, no, we're going to have a keen, like, we're going to bring someone in here to talk us through all this stuff, to talk about why we're doing it. So it's a really clear kind of announcement that, hey, we are trying to do something different. And I think that's one of the mistakes that I always made when I was an early leader was, you know, I'm reading all these books about leadership, trying to learn about all this different stuff. And I just kind of like always be like trying these different tactics. And I'm sure to the people who reported to me, they're just like, what, what is going on? Like, why, why are we suddenly using this question or having this language? We're all standing up in meetings, what's happening. <laughs> and you know, the, the more transparent you can be about that change, the better so that people, you know, realize what you're doing. And and I think that goes back to everything you're saying before. It gives them this situational awareness of, of what's happening. It gives them this clear intent of why you're trying to do these things. It's going to make even, it, it's, it got a little meta there for a second. It's like you're, change, you're, you're trying to make a broader change in the culture, but you're change managing that change as well. Yeah. And just to hit on this point real quick, when you said, you know, it takes you know, as leaders trying different things and the transparency and leadership, you know, what I'll do a lot of times, uh, especially when I do uh, my debrief workshops, as I call it, um, it is huge. I will always try to get, and almost always they do it, get the leader of that organization, whether it's, or that group, whether it's a, you know, senior VP or a VP, or maybe even a CEO, depending on the level I'm working with and have them kind of start off, you know, the, the debrief workshop with saying, Hey, you know, in the in the spirit of tone of accountability because that's really the first step in debriefing I, the first thing mm -hmm. i talk about is how do you set that tone um yeah. in that spirit of debriefing here's some things you know i know that i could have done better uh, whether it's on this particular task or yeah. this project or maybe yeah. just as a overall as a leader of this organization here's some things i've missed you know and i always yeah. tell them I'm like look here's the thing matt like if you were that leader i was like honestly it does it this it, you, I know you think like, it doesn't matter. They're going to love it that you're doing this. I mean, yeah. I said, you know, yeah. and it doesn't have to be huge, big things. Just take some things that you think you could have. And they're almost always like, yeah, I got some ideas, things I could do. And it's, it's so surprising how, not surprising me, but it's so amazing how people will say, man, that was, that was really refreshing. That was great. Like, you know, our, yeah. here's our leader. If they're saying, here's some things like whether maybe they don't do it a whole lot, but just be able to see that is a great way to start that kind of, yeah. that environment that, that open to bring down those barriers of communication before we start this debrief workshop. So but yeah. it just, it really goes into the point you were just talking about where, you know, leaders being transparent. Yeah. I have to, I do have to say that it is crazy how well you know me, even though we just met because just your example earlier of we're in the debrief and you're talking about my long landings, long landings was like the persistent thing that I struggled with through my entire flying career. I never wanted well, to let a landing go. <laughs> and the T-38, it was, it was very, very easily to do. So yeah, I, oh, yeah, sure. I, I've had my share as well. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's hilarious. Well, this has been great, Brandon. I think I think we really like crystallize it down to some really clear lessons learned. If people want to reach out to you, get to follow you a little bit more, what, what are the best ways for them to reach out? Absolutely. Um, well, as you know, I'm on you know social media, LinkedIn, yep. Instagram, Facebook. Yep. Uh, the one I typically spend most of my time on and put my content out on is LinkedIn. So definitely great. find me on LinkedIn. Um, I'm not sure you'll put the info uh, in the yep. show notes and things like that, but just search up. If you just search Brandon Williams speaker, uh, you'll find me on LinkedIn. Uh, please follow me, uh, reach out, connect, ask questions. Would love to uh, go to my website, uh, Brandon Williams speaker.com Brandon Williams speaker.com. Uh, and that'll have a bunch of info in there as well. That'll have my contact info. Uh, feel free to put my email address in the, uh, in the show notes as well, Matt, that's the best ways to, to reach out to me. But I love talking to people, love giving advice and, and just, and just, you know, a lot of the challenges we've talked about, I love it when people reach out and just say, Hey, I'm experiencing this, you know, have you ever seen this or how can you help me and just start a conversation. But yeah, uh, LinkedIn is where I put most of my stuff out probably right now. Perfect. Um, as we were talking earlier, I am getting ready to, uh, to start a podcast here soon. Uh, I'm just getting ready to, uh, start a book, sign with somebody to help me with that. So that's coming. Uh, but that's where I'm at right now. And um, yeah. 
Awesome. Well, looking forward to the podcast. Definitely looking forward to the book. I also am in the phase of trying to figure that out myself. Um, So this has been amazing. Thank you so much for your time and have a great rest of your day, Brandon. Thank you, Matt. Appreciate it. Thank you so much for listening to today's show. If you are looking for help turning your organization's great engineers into great managers, me and my team at Better Everyday Studios would love to help. We deliver targeted and interactive training workshops that are designed to help build the three fundamental skills of any new manager, building trust, giving feedback, and setting goals. Reach out to me through matt at bettereverydaystudios.com so we can start making your organization better every day.